All right, well, turning your Bibles to the Revelation this evening, chapter 16. Um, chapter 16, uh, we'll be beginning in verse 17. Um, I want to, again, I want to recap a little bit about this chapter because um, when we entered into this chapter, we entered into the final plagues. God said they were final. This is it. This is the wrath of God. This is, this is the judgment of God against the wicked and ungodly. This is the judgment of God against the world that denied His Son. He warned all. This is what the revelation is. See, everybody thinks of it as just prophecy, but it's a warning. It's a warning to all of humanity. It's a warning to everybody that will read it that there is coming a day it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So we're all going to face a judgment. Now I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I honestly and truly what I know about the Scriptures, you had really rather face judgment at the Bema Seat of Christ. Okay? Because at least at the Bema Seat, your advocate, Jesus, will be standing there with you. If you fail to be judged there, then the next judgment's going to come at the great white throne. Well, he's not going to be your advocate there. He's going to be your judge. He'll be your convictor then. You see, and the thing is, is that right now we have the opportunity. Right now it is so important that as we study through the Revelation, as we look at what he's telling and what he's saying, because when we finish tonight, we will spend the next two chapters talking about Babylon. Is it a literal Babylon? I believe it is. I believe it's a rebuilt Babylon, but as we'll dis discuss a little bit in the um, uh, in the text tonight and uh, in some of my notes, um, there's a whole lot of speculation. We know that there is, even in this world today, um, there is that um, that religion, that economic structure of Babylon. It's present in the world today. Uh, Babylon was a wicked city. It was an evil city. It was a city about money. It was a city about, um, well, everything but God. Everything about Babylon was anti-God. Even though while the Israelites were in captivity there, he made himself present. He made himself known. He... He made himself present and known to Nebuchadnezzar. He even demonstrated himself to Darius, king of the Medes and the Persians. So, I mean, it wasn't that God does not attempt. Even with the wicked and the ungodly, God attempts to show himself, to prove himself to be God. Not that he has to prove anything to mankind because he don't. But yet he still... He still loves humanity. He still loves us so much that he, he still makes that attempt. And that's what's so great about our God. That's what's so great about who He is. Is that even when we were yet sinners, He still loved us. Huh? Even when we weren't worthy of His love, He still loved us. So when we look at the Scriptures tonight, we look at the fact that there is, if you remember, there was, uh, with, the, with the opening of the seals, there was a break between the sixth and the seventh seal. The opening of the seventh seal brought on the judgments of the trumpets, the trumpet judgments. When we got to the sixth trumpet, there was a break between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet opened up everything to bring on the last plagues. But you notice that when the introduction of the bold judgments or the vile judgments, you notice that when they were introduced that he said, these are the final judgments and they come quickly. 
In other words, there'll be no lag. There'll be no, um, there'll be no time between them with one bowl, then comes the second. With the second comes the third. And with the third comes the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. And we see tonight that he does not pause. There is no pause. There's no reflection. There's no foreshadow or back look. Uh, he goes straight into the seventh judgment. He goes into the seventh bowl. And notice what the Word of God says. Join me. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thundering and lightning, and there was a great earthquake such as not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and, and the great and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. May God bless the reading and expounding of His holy word. May every word be His. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So here we see, we begin here with the pouring out of the seventh bowl judgment. And instantaneously we see that this bowl was poured out into the air. It was poured out into the atmosphere. Why would that be? Well, you need to remember who Satan was. You need to remember that he was described as the prince of the air of this atmosphere. Now, you got to remember that he's been cast out of heaven, okay? His, his time of going before God ended. This was his realm. So the last bold judgment was the final bold judgment, was the last one was poured out onto his, into his realm. This judgment was specific and direct. And you notice that instantaneously when the angel poured out that bold judgment and he poured it into the atmosphere, he poured it into the very air, you've got to remember now what sustains humanity, what sustains life on this planet. Oh, hmm, the air. But don't fret. Don't be heavy hearted. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said, right? In John 14. Well, don't be heavy hearted. For even those that believe that are still here, and they will be some there, they are shielded. God is able to protect. He's done it before. Last week I mentioned Egypt, right? Y'all do remember that the plagues that were cast down upon Egypt and upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians, you do realize that, that, that they didn't harm a single Israelite? Even to the cattle. I mean, really? The cattle are standing there grazing in the same pastures, grazing together. The Egyptian cattle fall dead and the Israeli... The Israelites' cattle continue to graze. <laughs> so you got to remember that God is able to sustain that which is His. These plagues, these judgments were not directed at God's people. Those that believed, they were directed straight 
at Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and everyone that had taken the mark of the beast. They were the targets of God's wrath. But now, they had opportunity. They had opportunity to choose. Every man, woman, and child will have an opportunity to choose. Christ has to be the choice. If Christ is not the choice, then there's only one other choice. There is not a third option. I know we live in a world today that wants a multitude of options. Well, if I don't want to be this, I want to be that. If I don't want to be that, I don't want to be that. No. In God's world, there's only two options. You either accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, dedicate your life, sacrifice the world to, to Him, and live for Him, or you choose the other path. And the Scripture says that one's wide, it's broad, and it leads where? Straight to destruction. So the thing that we always have to remember and we keep in mind when we're reading through the Revelation is that God is still protecting that which believes in Him. But that seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air and there came a great voice. God announced himself. It says, out of the temple of heaven from the throne, a message straight from God. It's done. It is done. This is the final judgment. This is it. He said it was over with. These were the last of the plagues. It's done, God announced. And there were voices and thunders and lightning and there was a great earthquake. Now, I want you to notice something, okay? And you can go back and do your own research. I think it's Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 11. Um, chapter 7 or 8 is the end of the seal the seals. What did we have? We had lightning and thunder and earthquakes. At the end of the trumpet judgments, in chapter 11, we had lightning and thunder and earthquakes. The final judgment we have lightning, thundering, and an earthquake. But this ain't an earthquake like the other two. This isn't an earthquake like any earthquake that has ever been in this world. This is the one that would turn the Richter scale upside down. This is the one that literally shakes the entire earth to the very core. unlike any earthquake since man was upon the earth. In other words, there hasn't been anything like this earthquake ever in this world. But then again, you see, we want God, we want, we want God to be our best friend, our buddy. We want Him to be able to stand beside us and let's put our arm around Him. We want to think of Him that way. But yet, no, we need to remember that He's the God, the creator of the universe. He can hold the world and the universe in the palm of His hand. He can balance all of creation on the end of one finger. That's the God that he is. He's that mighty a God. But yet still, but yet still, he can heal the brokenhearted. He can pick up the sparrow that has fallen. This is the God that he is. He's not your best friend. He is your creator. He is your sustainer. He is your protector. So when this earthquake comes, he's going to shake the earth to a very, to, to, well, oblivion pretty much. To the fact that 
it says that it was so mighty an earthquake and so great that the great city was divided into three parts. Jerusalem, the city of God, breaks into three pieces. Oh, but it doesn't end there. No. Pay real close attention to what happened. And the cities of the nations fail. Every city of every nation falls. Hmm. You know, I read a, uh, in one of my commentaries today that one of my commentators was saying, you know, that's possible today. If every tectonic plate were to move at one time, there wouldn't be nothing in this world left standing. So for those that don't believe it's by design, <laughs> okay, just keep living on in your naive world. Because there's coming a day that every city will fall. Not one building will remain standing. You got to remember now that also there's coming Armageddon. There's coming a battle. He's already opened the door for that, right? So what is this going to do? What is the fact that this kind of, of well, this kind of judgment upon the world, what is it going to do? I mean, he's already opened the door for them to come. I mean, he sent out the invitation. If you back up a little bit more into the judgments, you find out that he literally sent the invitation out by the, by the demons to all the kings of the east. Come, come on. You see, the thing is, is that God knows how he's going to end. He's already told us how it's going to end. It's those that are living in their little fantasy world that don't believe it's going to end that way. But he has yet to not carry through on a promise. He told Noah to build an ark, gave him the dimensions to it, said build it out of gopher wood and then seal it with pitch. And here's how big. Because it's going to rain. The earth is going to flood. Noah built an ark and had never seen a drop of rain. He built an ark not even knowing what a flood was. But did the flood come? Ah, uh, yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. So is he going to bring about what he's speaking of here? Yes, he is. And yes, he is, because every city of every nation must fall. You see, the thing about it is, is we have to remember also that, that, that God has already, in, in, in previous chapters, has already told his those that believed, those followers, that he was going to prepare them a place of sanctitude, right? So he's already moved those where he needs them at. We're already, um, we're already in heaven. We're just waiting for the horses to get ready. We're waiting for the King of kings and the Lord of lords to mount up and say, let's go. I mean, this is, this is what we're doing in heaven, but, but those that are still here that, that didn't take the mark of the beast and that still believe in, in God and still worship Jesus, these are protected by God. We've already seen it through the revelation. We already know that that's what He's doing. He's doing it for a purpose because He will not harm those which are His. Not that the Antichrist has not sent already millions by this time to death. 
but we've seen them in heaven. We've seen that multitude. We've seen those that were martyred. We know because a lot of this was a lot of the judgment, well, the, the judgment, the blood judgment um, that was poured out upon the rivers and the waters of the earth uh, was a response, was a retaliation, was what the, the saints, those that had been martyred that were under the altar before God had cried out for And so we know that this is this is going to be, uh, this is going to come to be. And then verse nineteen, about halfway through, he breaks into uh, Babylon once again. Now, the thing about it is, is as I said, the next two chapters are going to be a descriptive text about Babylon. Now, I believe that it's a rebuild. I believe that it's an actual city. But, you know, there are those that will tell you that it is a more modern-day Rome. Well, okay, um, don't think so. But they have that same mentality. They have before. Um, some of the commentary said, well, it could be Jerusalem. No, I don't think it could be Jerusalem. I do believe that it is a rebuilt Babylon because many of the nations of the world have looked into rebuilding Babylon on the Euphrates. When you get to looking at it and doing some research, you find out that, that um, Napoleon looked at rebuilding it. He looked at the very spot where Babylon supposedly at one time was and and it was such a magnificent city. You remember Nebuchadnezzar patted himself on the back as how great it was, right? How great the city was, how beautiful it was. It straddled the river. The river flowed through it. It had hanging gardens. I mean, it was spectacular. It had rooftop gardens, un un unlike anything ever been seen in the world. Napoleon looked into redoing it. Russia, when they had occupied part of uh, what is modern-day Iraq and Iran, they also considered it. Of course, they lost the battle and got run back. So you see, the thing is, is that it, it could very well be, and it probably will be. I'd tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to look into distance on my return um, because I'm not going to be here to, to know. Um, maybe from the point of view on re-entry, <laughs> coming to the battle, you see it in the distance. Maybe not. Who knows, right? All I know is, is that for the next two chapters, God wants you to take a vivid look, an in-depth look at Babylon. And if Babylon was not going to be a factor, why would he bother? It would be the hub of the Antichrist and Satan. It was splendorous, but yet it has that error. It has that it has that wickedness about it because of all that was done there. And it says, And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of his fierceness of his wrath. So he's going to direct. He's fixing to direct his wrath towards Babylon, which would bring us back to that very thought process of since he poured out this final judgment into the air, the realm of Satan, why would he not target the very heart of what the Antichrist may deem important? Because you remember it is, we talked about it in, in the earlier chapters, I mean, it is the fact that 
that there is a political environment, there is an economic environment that is everything about Babylon. That's what the Antichrist sets up in the world. That's how he becomes the world leader. And he says that God's going to pour out that cup of the fierceness of his wrath and it's going to be so intense. I, 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 this is the part that, that, that I can imagine during that, that, that massive earthquake. I can imagine that islands would disappear in the sea. I can imagine that mountains would collapse. Because the next thing he points out is that, that, that every island fled away. It went away. And the mountains were not found. Kind of kicks me over to the great white throne judgment. Because when the great white throne comes into view for the final judgment of those that have denied and rejected Christ, when the great white throne comes into view, Scripture tells us that the stars will flee from his sight and that the earth will also flee from his sight, not to be found. Huh? So it reminds me a little bit of that in the very fact that this is the judgment of God. And when the judgment of God comes, creation will bow, creation will submit. The final judgment has come and the islands have submitted to God. The mountains have surrendered. Again, I want to encourage you though. Because you see, God's not done. There's a new heavens, all new stars, and there's a new earth. Oh, and even if you are heartbroken over the fact that Israel, that Jerusalem may have split into three pieces, some good news there too. There's a new Jerusalem. Except this one's not built by the hands of man. This one's built by the very hands of God. Because John sees it as it descends. Said it was, said it was adorned as a bride, ready for the wedding. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? But every every part of creation, and then and then it doesn't end. Not only now has his the bowl been poured out into the air, and 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 it's finished. And then the earthquake comes, and it shakes, and the mountains and the and the islands are no more. Then verse twenty one gives those that took the mark of the beast and that rejected Christ even more good news. And there fell upon men great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent. And just if you want to know, in biblical terminology, a talent was based on how much weight a in that measurement, how much a man could carry. So you're looking at hailstones that would have been, according to biblical scripture now, would have been or will be somewhere between 60 and 100 pounds. That'll make a dent. Hmm. I mean, that'll make a dent. I don't think when I was in construction, our hard hat was rated for that. Of course, I've hit my heads a few times, and I thought maybe I hit 100 pounds worth, but anyway. But you think about it, though. This is it. This is the final judgment. 
every stone about the weight of a talent. In other words, they were going to be, there will be somewhere between 60 and 100 pounds, give or take, but every one of them is going to weigh the same. Just so you'll know, I don't expect that to be pea size. But then again, you know, we get in our mind sometimes when we think about biblical principles and biblical things. We get in our mind sometimes, we think about it on our own terminology. You see, we think about when somebody was stoned that they were stoned with rocks. No, they were stoned with stones. Okay? Okay? It won't rocks that were thrown at them, but stones. So we have to remember that when we're thinking on biblical on scriptural principles in scripture, we have to remember that that the way things were may not be exactly the way we think. We need to make sure. That's the reason why God went to the point to say that they were about the size of a talent. Because the biblical weight of that is somewhere between 60 and 100 pounds. So, just, that's information. And you notice what happened? And do you notice? And men blaspheme God. They blasphemed because of the plagues of hell. And the plague thereof was exceedingly great. They blasphemed. The thing about it is, is that you can't even, no matter what, those people, those those that are going to choose to reject Christ are going to reject Him right on up to the end. The more that God poured out, the harder their heart got. But did that not happen to Pharaoh also? You see, the thing is, is that as God tries to show and demonstrate Himself to us, we need to be paying attention. We need to be listening to the Spirit of God. Because it is ever so important that we have, that we understand and that we hear His voice. It's so important because, you see, the problem is, is that there are those that that even today reject. I mean, there are, they, there are those today whose heart are so hard that they can't, they just refuse to hear. And this is early. They still have time now. These that have received the punishment of this bowl, their time is up. Their time was up the moment they took the mark of the beast. Their days were finished. They were numbered. These were the last of the plagues. This is the end. This is this is the 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 last. Well, this is the last plague. This would end the great tribulation. But just so you know, we have to get at picture of Babylon. So we'll spend time now letting God show us all about Babylon. That great whore is what the next chapter calls it. And so we'll break into chapter 17 next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your holy word. We thank you for all that you provide for us. We thank you for your leadership and your guidance. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, well, for loving us now, giving us the opportunity now. I pray that everyone that would hear your holy word would surrender their hearts to you. 
that, Lord, you might be the Lord of their life. Lord, I, I just I, I pray for the hearts of the people. I pray for this nation and for this world. Lord, I pray for those that are sin sick and lost. I pray, Lord, for the, the church. That the church would love you, be your light, and stand on your principles. Lord, now I ask you to lead us, to guide us, and direct us. Lord, we're going to be ever so careful to give you praise, honor, and glory, for it is yours and yours alone. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you for being with us this evening. Uh, See you Sunday morning. God bless.